Now let's turn to a very important issue for all of us here at CBS This Morning. As you may know, we are very committed to stopping the stigma around mental health. Medical experts say being a target of racism can have a detrimental effect on physical and emotional health and may cause or worsen depression and anxiety. That's according to the FBI hate crimes in the U.S. reached their highest levels in more than a decade in 2019. Nearly 56 percent were motivated by race and ethnicity. We spoke with three people about how recent cases of harassment and discrimination have affected their mental health. Brandon Vota is an Asian-American lighting programmer. Brianna Harmon is a fourth grade teacher who is black and Mexican. And Alexander Rosenberg is Jewish and a deputy regional director for the Anti-Defamation League. When the pandemic happened, I was freaked out. And everything that's happened with that, George Floyd and so many more, Mentally, it was draining. I've personally had a few experiences where I was told to go back where I came from and to take my Kung flu, to take the China flu with me. Over the past four years or so, we have seen nearly a tripling of the incidents and the calls that we receive. Seeing grandmothers being pushed and shoved on the street, I saw my grandmother in those people. and. That was a big awakening part for myself because I personally uh, lost my grandmother to COVID in January. I'm still going through the grief. When my boyfriend leaves and to go to work, I am always just thinking, worrying, making sure that he is safe. I'm in fear that him as an African-American man can get pulled over anywhere and anything can happen. Has it ha affected me deeply? Uh, it has affected my family life, and it's just seeing the amount of things that the, the human race and, and, and humans in general are capable of doing is, is deeply disheartening. I think the hardest part about mental health is feeling like you're alone in all of it. But seeing so many people stand up has been very beautiful and heartwarming. The fact that all communities are speaking out in allyship, I feel is a very welcome change. I think the biggest thing is to speak up, not be silent and not be either scared or don't minimalize it. Share your stories. We need to come as a community together. Yes, we do. Psychiatrist Dr. Sue Varma joins us now to discuss. Sue, it's good to see you. I like what Mr. Rosenberg said, that to see what humans are capable of is deeply disturbing. I sometimes think about that, too. Like, how can you be so evil and be so unkind? And I don't think it's a surprise to anyone that, you know, uh, racism affects your mental health. What I want to hear from you, mental and physical health, what can you tell us about the, the specifics of that, about how we're affected? Yeah, so Gail, you know, discrimination causes us to feel excluded and rejected. And I think of this as a death by a thousand cuts. All these micro traumas layered upon each other causes a person in the long run chronic stress, which if left unchecked can lead to anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, substance abuse, and because of this chronic sense of low self-worth can sometimes even lead to suicide. You also talk about the model minority myth. What does that mean? Yes. So the model minority myth has to do with this idea that we're supposed to somehow be more successful. Um, and I look at it as an overcompensation. You know, like uh, in, in a lot of cultures, particularly Eastern cultures, the idea is that a person should be quiet. You should fly under the radar. You don't want to make waves. And the problem is, is that just leaves some people to be a target. And we know that racism in, across all minority communities, as you mentioned, not just the mental health toll, but as a physical toll, it really wreaks havoc in the body and puts us more at risk for heart attacks, um, for strokes, for obesity, um, for high blood pressure, and get this, even premature aging. We can see this mm -hmm. on a cellular level, Gail. Hey, Sue, I, I'm curious about interventions here, uh, what they might potentially be. Uh, there was a recent study that found that 27 percent of people uh, recall seeing racist content on social media. I'm sure there's a, a large number of people who also see it in their daily life, even among their own friends. How, if at all, should they confront it or intervene? 
Yes. And, you know, the study that you're talking about, Tony, has to do with like 14 to 22 year olds. So we're talking about young adults whose identity has not quite yet formed. In the young adult, the, their brain is still developing executive functioning, attention and memory. And they're really um, at threats for being bullied, for um, high suicide rates. And what you want to do is really develop their sort of self of sense and a uh, sense of self and self-esteem that comes from having pride in one's roots, having pride in your racial and ethnic identity, knowing where you came from, knowing the history and some of the accomplishments of the great people, men and women, um, in from your background. And I think that that can be having a great self-esteem, a buffer, and be a resiliency to bullying, uh, to discrimination, um, and to, th to threats. But, Sue, on the social media front, is that something people should respond to, do you think? Because it's it's so prevalent out there. A quarter of the people, as, as, as Tony mentioned in this survey, say they've been exposed to it in some way. Yes. You know, it's so tough, Anthony. Like, how do we, we really have to be very deliberate about our social media use. And this is something that I'm noticing about myself is that do we have a tendency to want to go on what we call doom scroll is just keep on no. looking for yes. negative information. Yeah. And we're looking for certainty. Really, that's what we're looking for. But we really need to pick and choose. And what we need to put out there is positive content. Look, we cannot fight the trolls back with hate. And really, this meme of hate is a virus is very true because it is contagious, right? And it has detrimental mental and physical health. And so when we talk about parallel pandemics, we've talked about COVID, we've talked about mental health, and now we're talking about racism as parallel pandemics and sort of infectious sources in the community. So, this really does impact a person's mental and physical, so physical let's health talk from about head to toe. Let's talk about something that's happening in the news today. It's such a terrible day in Boulder, Colorado. I think about the man who said, listen, I almost lost my life just going to buy some chips and a soda. A grandfather talked about his people that had gone in to get a COVID shot. Anybody who was in that grocery store is experiencing trauma. Those 10 families who are waking up today without their loved ones are experiencing trauma. What is your advice for anyone who has gone, who is experiencing trauma right now? Mm -hmm. Yes. So the first thing we want to do is just get back to the basics. You know, there used to be this idea of debriefing where you needed to talk about things. We don't need to rehash things in that moment, right? Mm -hmm. That will come with time to talk to talk, talk therapy down the road. Right now, what a person needs is just basic food, comfort, shelter, safety. We call them their five things. Um, a sense of self-efficacy that I can do things. Uh, a sense of safety that, you know, I don't, I'm not going to get re-traumatized. A sense of hope that better days lie ahead. A sense of calm through meditation, through relaxation, to, through talk therapy, um, and a sense of connectedness. We know that social support, as somebody who used to work with the 9-11 mental health program, I work with victims of 9-11 uh, and survivors, and we know that social support across the board really helps decrease some of this trauma. And it is very, very painful. There's going to be a lot of grieving, and I'm hoping that we can get together. You know, one of the things that we missed in, the, in COVID is being able to hug one another, yes. the role of physical touch, the role to have, be able to mourn together, to, to to, to touch and and an oxytocin is a hormone that's secreted when we're feeling stressed when we're feeling anxious and touch can bring that down yeah human touch so important thank you sue varma always good to have you here if you or someone you know is seeking mental health resources you can call the national alliance on mental illness helpline that number is 1-800-950-6264 that number again is 1-800-950-6264 or in a crisis text nami spelled n-a-m-i to 741741.